I'm Kenneth Freeman. You can call me Kenny. Call me Kenny B. Anything I'm like Gene says except late for dinner. Um, I have 1A. I was diagnosed in 2002 at the age of 29. I was genetically confirmed a year later by Dr. Shai. Since then, so for the last 20 years, I've been, uh, I've worked in CMT advocacy where I'm passionate about giving everybody the tools they need to have as informed of a conversation as is possible with their healthcare providers about their disease, whether that be about bracing, genetics, breathing, and just CMT in general. I am an employee of the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation, or the HNF. Um, I founded Experts in CMT website in 2020, which kind of gives a perspective on CMT from a patient first perspective. So I'm a patient before I'm anything else. And I try to take the technical out of the technical and present it in a way that everybody can relate to. And within the website is my blog. And if you've seen me anywhere on social media, you've seen the links that I've shared, whether it be the breathing stuff, the genetic stuff, or just CMT in general. Um, I'm a CMT genetics expert where I, I serve um, within that hat with the CMTA with several different biofarm and biotech companies. I serve as the CMT genetics expert with uh, my role with HNF. I'm also a um, CMT breathing expert, where I've co-authored with the various neuromuscular pulmonologists, including Dr. Ashraf El Sayi from Cedar sinai I provide consulting services to other um, nonprofit CMT organizations, biopharm, biotech, healthcare providers. And what else? I know I'm forgetting something. I'm always forgetting something. But if, if you've seen me around in social media, um, you know, I like to be active. If someone has a question, I do whatever I can to answer it. If I can't answer it, I do what I can to point you in the right direction. And that'll hold true today. Um, if you have a question that I can't answer, I will do everything I can to point you in the right direction so you can get the answers that you need. Then what we're gonna cover today, the type of breathing problems that CMT can cause, the muscles involved in breathing and how they can become impacted by CMT, the nerves that control the breathing muscles, which are the breathing mus uh, muscle motor control nerves, which is, uh, it's important to make the distinction between motor control nerves with breathing and autonomic control for breathing. The autonomic control is the brain controlling breathing, whether you're thinking about it or not thinking about it. The motor control are the nerves that actually control the uh, muscles themselves used for breathing, where the nerves that control the muscles in your arms, for example, are motor nerves. They help you to move your arm. The breathing muscles have the same type of nerves, and those can be impacted in CMT. We'll cover the prevalence rates for breathing problems in CMT, where it hasn't been necessarily widely studied Thanks to Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation and the Global Registry for Inherited Neuropathies CMT Natural Study, we actually have some data on the prevalence of CMT in breathing. I'll go over some CMT breathing symptoms, preferred methods for treating those uh, problems, what kind of doctor we're best served by. I'm going to go over uh, several myths while we're going through everything to clear up any confusion surrounding those. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have time for a bunch of question and answers. We're scheduled for two hours, but I'll stay on as long as we need to, to make sure you get the answers you need or that you're at least getting pointed in the right direction to get those answers. If I leave you with nothing else today, I wanna leave you with just this one simple sentence. Just as the muscles of the feet and ankles can become weakened in CMT, so too can the muscles used for breathing. I want you to think about this question as we go through the presentation today. So is it exercise or activity induced asthma or rather, is it a reduction in the ability to increase tidal volume 
during periods of increased respiratory demand? Might seem like a confusing question, but I think as we, we go through the talk today, the answer will kind of reveal itself. They can see, can CMT cause breathing problems? Everybody in this room knows that it can. So the short answer is yes, it can. But CMT does not affect the lungs. It is not a lung disease. There is a caveat, however, that we'll go over in a few minutes. CMT can cause breathing problems by causing the breathing muscles to become weakened. And this is an important distinction, but not every CMT or for reasons we don't understand will experience this. Even within the same family, um, a brother, for example, can have severe breathing issues as part of his CMT, yet his sister won't have anything, and we don't understand why. And CMT causes obstructive lung disease. This is kind of a topic or an area that we see a lot across social media in the community. The short answer is no, CMT cannot and does not cause an obstructive lung disease. So obstructive lung disease causes an obstruction to airflow out of the lungs when you're breathing out. Air gets in, but it's difficult to get back out. It becomes trapped. Obstructive lung disease leads to a reduction in oxygen in the blood and will lead to an elevation in carbon dioxide levels as well which can actually be worse than low oxygen. Obstructive lung disease causes hyperinflation. That's part of that air retention where the lungs remain partially, excuse me, partially inflated. We call that hyperinflation. They don't empty completely. Then hyperinflation is just a condition in which the lungs cannot fully empty when breathing out. And that's, that's going to be an important distinction to remember as we move forward through this. And examples of an obstructive lung disease include emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and a condition called bronchiectasis. And I skipped one. So CM, can CMT cause restrictive lung disease? This is kind of like the opposite of obstructive lung disease. And no, CMT cannot and does not cause restrictive lung disease. There's a great deal of misconception about this. But remember, there's a caveat to CMT affecting the lungs or causing a lung disease. And this kind of confusion, misconception about CMT causing a restrictive lung disease is part of that caveat that we'll cover. So restrictive lung disease causes the restriction to airflow into the lungs. Air cannot get to the lungs. So where Obstructive lung disease causes air to become trapped in the lungs. Restrictive air or restrictive lung disease kind of prevents it from, not really prevents, but makes it very difficult to get into the lungs. Restrictive lung disease will lead to an increase in carbon dioxide levels, usually not a reduction in oxygen levels. And examples of a restrictive lung disease include sarcoidosis, which is an autoimmune disease, the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is just a pulmonary fibrosis, a disease of the air sacs um, and the linings of the air sacs within the lungs. And we don't know the, the cause of it, hence idiopathic. And then pleurisy, which is a condition affecting the pleural cavity or the um, pleural sac that kind of protects the lungs with uh, um, inside the chest cavity. Then CMT and thoracic cavity respiratory disease. What are these big giant words? So the thoracic cavity is just simply the chest cavity. Medicine has big fancy names for everything. Once we know what those big fancy words mean, medicine becomes really easy to understand. So the thoracic cavity respiratory disease is any respiratory impairment that causes a reduction in the ability to fully expand the chest cavity with each breath. As confusing as that sentence is, it'll become a lot clearer as we move forward. And this is the type of respiratory impairment that CMT can cause. It's a thoracic cavity respiratory disease. Did I skip something? I'm hitting my buttons too fast, so I apologize. So CMT respiratory impairment, the full name is CMT-induced neuromuscular respiratory muscle weakness. So it's why I, I always shorten it to CMT breathing, 
CMT related breathing, CMT related problems, just something that's not as confusing for me to say or get tongue twisted on as I'm trying to spit out the words. So it's caused by the muscles used for breathing becoming weakened as a consequence of CMT's effects on the nerves that control or innervate these muscles. This is part of the, just as CMT can cause the muscles of the feet and ankles to become weakened, so too can the breathing muscles become weakened. So where the nerves that control the muscles of the feet and ankles become affected, and that messes up our feet and ankles, this thing can happen with the muscles used for breathing. This leads to a reduction in the ability to full, fully expand the chest cavity with each breath, which is the very definition of thoracic cavity respiratory disease. And you can hear me running out of breath now. So as a consequence, there's a reduction in the ability to fully inflate the lungs with each breath, which is hypoinflation, which we talked about with restrictive lung disease. And this is where some of that confusion comes from with CMT causing restrictive lung disease. So where restrictive lung disease causes hypoinflation or reduction in the ability to fully inflate the lungs with each breath, they don't get enough air in, CMT-related breathing muscle weakness also causes hypoinflation, thereby the confusion about a restrictive lung disease. Oxygen levels usually will remain normal. And I say this carefully, usually will remain normal. We're gonna, we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but carbon dioxide levels become very high. And this isn't unique to CMT related breathing. We see this across the board in all neuromuscular related respiratory impairment. Carbon dioxide becomes the, the issue, it becomes the enemy rather than a low oxygen level. The breathing muscles, the fun stuff. So during the introduction, I mentioned that the diaphragm um, gets all the attention. Diaphragm becomes weakened, but it's not the only muscle used for breathing, and it's not the only one that becomes weakened. So while the diaphragm is arguably the most important breathing muscle, the intercostal muscles, which are the muscles of the rib cage are equally as important because these muscles are the ones that expand and retract the chest cavity with each breath. If we can't expand the chest cavity with each breath, we're not going to get in enough air. So when weakened, chest cavity again, it cannot fully expand outwards or upwards as we need it to. And these muscles become weakened because the nerves that control them, and there's many nerves, are impacted by CMT, just as the nerves that control the muscles in our feet and ankles. The respiratory accessory muscles, these, these are the ones that don't get anywhere near the attention they should when we're talking about CMT and breathing. But the respiratory accessory muscles are the muscles that assist the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. The sternocleidomastoid and the scalene muscles of the neck Big, big, huge, fancy words, which are just, just describe the muscles that come down the side of the neck to the front of the chest or the top of the chest. And then the trapezius muscle, which is the big one in the back of the neck that comes down from the top of the neck at the base of the skull and down in between the shoulder blades. Those muscles work together to expand the chest cavity outwards and upwards with each breath. The pectoralis major has got always tongue ties me. Let's try it again. Pector alis majors, or the pecs. We all know what the pecs are. While those are chest muscles that help us move our arms up and down, they're also important muscles in expanding the chest cavity outwards. And these muscles can become impacted by CMT. Then additionally, the abdominal muscles assist the diaphragm, muscles of the throat and the larynx, the voice, assist with keeping the upper airways open, and the transverse thoracic muscle, which is the muscle at the bottom of your sternum, assists with retracting the chest cavity as you exhale.
And then the really fun, confusing stuff, the nerves that control all this stuff. I think before we move forward, though, um, just a note on the, the vocal cords. So we have an upper airway. We have a lower airway. Lower airway is everything below the vocal cords. The upper airway is everything at and above the vocal cords. So we do know vocal cords can become weakened in CMT. What we don't talk about enough in the community, at least health, healthcare in general, um, doesn't talk about enough. Patients do, because we talk about it every day because we experience it. When the voice becomes impacted by CMT, so too does our breathing. When the breathing muscles become impacted by CMT, so too does the voice. They kind of go hand in hand. So when a cmt -er has vocal issues or uh, vocal cord weakness, I almost said paralysis, weakness. Um, paralysis is kind of a vocal cord paralysis is uh, beyond the scope of today's talk. When the vocal cords become weakened, the breathing muscles typically are already weakened. And if they're not, they have to work that much harder just to get air through the vocal cords. And from that, we can experience fatigable weakness of the breathing muscles. That is, the breathing muscles become weakened because they're having to work that much harder. Also, the opposite side of that, when the breathing muscles become weakened, but the vocal cords haven't necessarily become weakened, they too can then become weakened through fatigable weakness from trying to counteract the weakness of the breathing muscles. And now the nerves. So the phrenic nerve, phrenic nerve, phrenic, tomato, tomato, is the only nerve that provides movement control to the diaphragm. And this is kind of important um, in the context of CMT and breathing because most of our muscles um, have control from several different nerves so that when one nerve gets injured, or becomes impacted by something like CMT, there's other nerves that can kind of pick up the slack, excuse me, and help that muscle. The diaphragm doesn't have that, unfortunately. So when the phrenic nerve becomes impacted by CMT, the diaphragm very quickly starts to weaken. And this phrenic nerve originates up in the neck from uh, vertebrate C3 through C5. The image to the left um, kind of depicts the phrenic nerve in the little yellow pencil lines. However, the artist also includes branches of that same nerve wrapping around the heart, which this is an incorrect diagram then of the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve goes only to the diaphragm. What the artist has included in here is branches of the vagus nerve, which goes to the heart as part of the phrenic nerve. So that's an incorrect representation of what the phrenic nerve is. But it is correct, at least at the, the neck where it starts, and it is correct down at the diaphragm where it ends. And the phrenic nerve, of course, is part of the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nerves are every nerve that lie outside the brain in the spinal cord. Then when impacted by CMT, it will lead to neurogenic weakness of the diaphragm. Neurogenic weakness is weakness caused by something in the nerves, whether it be the nerve just stops working, the nerve is injured, whatever the case may be. In CMT, when we experience weakness and atrophy because the nerves are just whack, it's called neurogenic weakness. And when it leads to atrophy, it's called neurogenic atrophy. Neurogenic weakness and neurogenic atrophy are not recoverable. So that when the muscles become weakened because of uh, dysfunction in the nerves, we cannot gain that strength back. And this is true with the diaphragm as well. So once our diaphragm starts to weaken, we unfortunately don't recover that strength. We can try to maintain it at whatever baseline, but we won't regain the strength where it used to be. When the diaphragm weakens, it leads to an elevation of either one side or both sides. The diaphragm, while it looks like one muscle in this picture, is actually two muscles. We have a right hemi di uh, diaphragm. We have a left hemi diaphragm. Normally, the right side sits higher to begin with. This is kind of important in imaging the diaphragm when we're trying to assess weakness. We expect normally the right side will be a little higher than the left. 
The issue becomes when it's significantly higher. It encroaches into the chest cavity, cuts down on the chest cavity volume, and impacts overall lung volume. Sometimes both sides will become weakened, and then both sides kind of elevate, and it becomes a little more difficult to clinically, diagnostically determine if one side is elevated higher than the other if both are climbing into the chest. What did I leave off? The phrenic. So now the cranial nerves and the intercostal nerves. These ones don't get any attention when we talk about CMT and breathing because we only talk about the phrenic nerve. But these ones definitely bear discussion because it helps us to understand all the, all the muscles that do become weakened when CMT or when breathing is impacted in CMT. So the cranial nerves are a group of 12 pairs of nerves that connect the head, neck, and vital organs directly to the brain without going through the spinal cord. These are the only nerves in the peripheral nervous system that don't connect to the spinal cord. And although cranial kind of infers that um, they're not part of anything except the brain, because brain's in our head, which is our cranium, they are part of the peripheral nervous system. Cranial nerve 11, which is also called the accessory nerve, coincidentally, amongst its other functions, controls the sternocleidomastoid and the uh, trapezius muscles. So that when it becomes impacted by CMT, we have a reduction in the ability to expand the chest cavity upwards with each breath, but also we start having kind of a, a reduction in the ability to hold our head up. Our head becomes heavy. We see this in uh, myasthenia gravis, or at least we talk about it in myasthenia gravis, where the neck muscles get weakened, so we have a hard time holding up our head. This can happen in CMT as well. And then um, within the, the trapezius becomes weakened, we start having shoulder strength issues. These same shoulder strength issues can contribute to difficulty in breathing. Cranial nerve nine, called the, or what's also called the glossopharyngeal nerve, is part of what controls our voice. It, it's mainly responsible for the muscles that pick up the larynx or high notes. And, and then just bring that up to a simmer and whisk it together until they have a beautiful voice. And then I like. Hi, Joy. <laughs> Hi, guys. Sorry about that. Hi, Toby. Um, so cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, um, mainly responsible for picking up the voice when we go to speak, especially with high notes when the vocal cords have to tighten. When this nerve becomes impacted in CMT, our vocal cords become impacted. When the vocal cords become impacted, they become weakened. When they become weakened, we then have a reduction in the ability to get air into and out of the lungs because they have to pass through the vocal cords. With the weakened vocal cords, if we can't, or we have a reduction in the ability to hold them open fully, we start to induce fatigable weakness with the rest of the muscles that are having to compensate for that weakness. And then called the IC nerves or the intercostal nerves are a group of 11 nerves that control the external intercostal muscles or the muscles on the most outside part of your rib cage, the internal intercostal muscles, which are the nerves, the muscles on the most inner part of the rib cage, and the transversus thoracis muscle, and then the abdominal muscles and the intercostal muscles. All of them as a group are controlled by intercostal nerves three through six. It might be a little difficult to really flesh out, at least today, which of those four nerves control each of the various muscle groups. But then the transverse thoracic muscle is controlled by IC2 through IC5. So that muscle alone has four nerves that control it, unlike the diaphragm, which only has one nerve. The abdominal muscles are then controlled by IC nerves I37 through IC11. So if we look at just how some of these overlap, you can see how one nerve becomes impacted, potentially 
several different muscles or muscle groups are becoming impacted. Then the scalene muscles of the neck are controlled by the cervical spinal nerves, C3 through C C3s through C8, which again originating in the neck. So although they're called cervical spinal nerves, they're not cranial nerves, they're not intercostal nerves, even though they're on this slide, despite their name, they're still peripheral nerves. So all the peripheral nerves have a spinal location, well, it, except for the cranial nerves, of course. Um, so despite when you're reading anything, despite a, a name that might say spinal nerve, they are part of the peripheral nervous system. Anybody else getting static? Is my mic staticky? You know, because I can hear a bunch of static from my mic and my headset. Yeah, I was sounding a little weird. I am weird, so. <laughs> Is it a battery issue? Not a battery issue. Who knows? I'm going to turn my mic off and turn it right back on. Any better? Yes, no, maybe, staticky. Did that solve my weirdness? No, no static in South Australia. <laughs> I, I got no uh, static. No, hey, we'll run with it then. No static. So, so, so this slide might seem like a, a um, kind of a no-brainer. CMT affects the peripheral nerves. But CMT affects all peripheral nerves to varying degrees. So sometimes only the motor nerves, sometimes only the sensory nerves, sometimes both, and then sometimes the autonomic nerves are affected as well. So the motor nerves um, are the important ones for uh, today's talk, control muscle movement. So when impacted skeletal muscle, which breathing muscles are skeletal muscle, can become weakened um, due to the effects of CMT. Then breathing muscles, of course, are controlled um, by the motor nerves. Therefore, just as the muscles of the feet and ankles, that seems to be today's theme, can become weakened in CMT, so too can the muscles used for breathing. Breathing prevalence in CMT. This one might be a shocker. So how common are breathing problems in CMT? So 15 years ago, it didn't happen. 10 years ago, it happened, yeah, but it was still ultra rare. Five years ago, it happened, but it was too rare to spend any time talking about it. GRIN data, I mentioned GRIN at the beginning. GRIN is the acronym for Global Registry for Inherited Neuropathies. It's the only large-scale study that is looking at breathing problems in CMT and is collecting prevalence rates. No other study has done this. When querying GRIN, I have to move that. You don't see it, but I have all kinds of different boxes on my screen for whatever reason from Zoom. But querying GRIN, 17% of participants who have 1A report breathing problems. 13% of X1 report breathing problems. 21% of participants who have CMT1B report breathing problems. CMT2, which encompasses uh, the CMT2 clinical diagnosis participants, those that don't haven't yet found their gene, 17% report breathing issues in CMT. This far outpaces anything available in medical literature. It far outpaces anything previously known about CMT and breathing. Because remember, even five years ago, it was so rare that it wasn't worth talking about. However, we know in the community that breathing issues in CMT are far more common than what the medical medical literature has told us. We go to the doctor, I can't breathe. Well, it's not your CMT. Well, how do you know? Because CMT doesn't cause breathing issues yet. Here we are. We all know it does. The data from GRIN 
uh, which Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation was nice enough to to uh, provide for today's talk, um, is in line with what we see in the community when we're talking about it. So the issues are real, even if our doctors want to tell us they're not. So when you say it didn't happen 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, or whatever, is that mm -hmm. just because the data wasn't there and so they weren't, they, they said it wasn't happening? And it really wasn't no, it, it, it's, it, it's more, more along the lines of um, healthcare providers absolutely knew it didn't exist you know, 15 years ago. I have CMT and I can't breathe. Okay, it's not your CMT. It's something else. Here's some inhalers and drugs for you. And then 10 years ago, healthcare providers kind of started to see that, okay, maybe CMT does cause some breathing issues, but it's just, it's ultra rare. It's, we only see it, you know, like hypothetically, you know, one hundredth of 1% of all CMT patients will ever have breathing issues. Five years ago, okay, we acknowledge it can cause breathing stuff, but it happens so rarely that I'm just not going to spend time talking about it. I have to spend my time elsewhere talking about things that are more prevalent in the CMT. And then, you know, here we are today with a data snapshot, which gets us closer to about 20% of all CMTers are experiencing breathing problems which is very in line with what we see in the community every day. If you have, this is going to be a shameless plug. If you have breathing issues and you're not yet registered in GRIN, register in GRIN because getting your breathing problems accounted for is what's needed to change the landscape in healthcare to fully acknowledge the breathing issues that we all deal with every day. I can't stress enough how important it is for the data. And it's not HNF collecting data to do with whatever HNF wants to do with it. Global Registry for Inherited Neuropathies is an NIH funded, IRB approved CMT natural history study what that means is and, um, NIH is the U.S. version of um, NHS. So it's an NIH-funded natural history study. So it's a recognized clinical study. It's IRB-approved. IRB is the Institutional Review Board, which governs any study that involves human subjects. They have to approve everything you do with the study. And they have done that with GRIN. So it is a legitimate natural history study. It's open to everybody on the globe versus some other smaller ones who are just very specific to subtypes or very specific to certain um, populations of CMT. This one's open to everybody and it's free. Stand by. Can I you can? How about now? Yeah. I can hear you now. 
I lost all screen controls and then the batteries on my mic died. How about that? Can you still see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Is this where we left off? I lost track right quick. Pretty much. Okay. Now here we are. So how come? So, okay. We left off on that one. Okay. So breathing problems from the weakened breathing muscles are seen in almost every subtype. I say almost thus far in um, talking to the investigative team who's running the drug trial for sword CMT. Um, at Applied Therapeutics, they haven't yet had any study participant report breathing problems. So while we essentially see breathing problems across the board, it's not um, unique to any one subtype. Thus far, I can say SWORD CMT doesn't have reported breathing problems, but it's still early in our understanding of SWORD, so that might very well change. CMT1J, CMT2B4, 2S, and the newly discovered CRYAB or CRYAB associated CMT can include very severe respiratory impairment. Specific to CRYAB, study authors for the first time in publishing their discovery specifically state cardiac and respiratory um, assessments at least annually to get ahead of any cardiac or respiratory involvement that might happen. And it's not necessarily because it's seen in CMT, but mutations in the cryab gene have linkage to um, cardiac and respiratory issues. So regardless of subtype as well, although 1J, 2B4, and 2S can be extremely severe, breathing impairment in CMT, regardless of subtype, can be severe. It could be mild, it can be moderate, it can be severe. So it's kind of across the board, and unfortunately, there's just no way to predict how severe it's going to get. So what are the symptoms of all this stuff that most of us already know? So the symptoms include, but are not limited to, not limited to dyspnea, that's a fun word to say, or just shortness of breath, shallow breathing, Increased shortness of breath when lying flat on her back or supine, supine, which is called orthopnea. Increased shortness of breath with physical exertion. This is going to uh, lend itself to the question that we asked when we started. A weak cough because the same muscles that are used for breathing are used for coughing. Obstructive sleep apnea, which is very common in CMT. We're even predisposed to the obstructive sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea, which is, uh, is a different kind of uh, stop breathing when you're sleeping. Nocturnal hypopnea, these are fun words. And then elevated carbon dioxide levels, which are a hallmark of neuromuscular-related breathing issues, not just CMT. So orthopnea, what's orthopnea? Orthopnea is just the fancy word for difficulty with breathing when you're lying flat on your back. It's common in CMT. It's often an early sign that the breathing muscles are starting to become weakened. And individuals with orthopnea, like myself, often sleep on several pillows to elevate our head and our upper body. That helps to offset the effects of gravity pulling on our organs and uh, impacting our breathing muscles. For me, it goes back years. I mean, years to I was a teenager. I'm 50 now. So I've always had to have my head elevated on a stack of pillows, and I never knew why. And I, I have kind of the, the, um, an OCD thing about, about me now with my pills. My pills have to be situated a certain way because if they don't, I will die. And there's actually a little bit of truth to that because if I'm not propped up the right way, I could very well stop breathing and then not start again when I'm asleep. So obstructive sleep apnea, um, which we're predisposed to, there, there's a ton of research on it. I have just one uh, source down at the bottom. It occurs when the throat or the upper airway becomes obstructed when sleeping, leading to a disruption in sleep. And apnea is just the medical word for stop breathing when you're sleeping. And in CMT, the throat and the upper airway becomes obstructed because the muscles of the throat 
an upper airway become weakened. So everything collapses on itself. It can occur in CMT without any additional respiratory muscle weakness. And when there's no other respiratory muscle weakness, it's very easily treated just like it is in the general public. And central sleep apnea, or CSA, occurs when there's a temporary interruption in the signals from the brain that control the autonomic function of breathing, or that is breathing without thinking about it, breathing while sleeping. It's underdiagnosed in CMT. I believe, these are my words, my thoughts, I believe it's underdiagnosed in CMT. I don't have data to back it up. When I talk to CMTers in the community, we start talking about breathing and sleep studies and apnea. We start looking at reports. Often, there's more central apnea events in the reports than there are obstructive apnea events, and they get overlooked. They don't get discussed at all. Central apnea is very treatable, but it's not treated with conventional standard OSA treatment, which is CPAP, because CPAP can't counteract the lack of muscle movement. CPAP can only keep the airway open, which we're going to talk about. Can I ask a question now? We're going to be asking questions later. Oh, all kinds of time for questions later, but please ask. Oh, just I'll probably forget. So you're saying anyone with CMT, a, a CPAP machine is not going to work for us? Um, not everybody. And how, how do I raise this? Um, so I want to be careful. <laughs> Generally, CMTers who have breathing involvement will fail on CPAP therapy. However, if you have obstructive sleep apnea and no other breathing muscle weakness, CPAP should work very well for you, just like it would in the general public. But as soon as we introduce any type of any level of respiratory muscle weakness, we start to fail CPAP. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit here in just okay. a couple minutes. We're leading right up to that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Oh, see, where did I leave off the top of that one? That one. Hey, here we are. So nocturnal hypopnea. No, more fun words. So nocturnal is just nighttime when you're sleeping. And hypopnea. Hypopnea is defined as a period of shallow breathing that lasts for more than 10 seconds while you're asleep. Well, hypopnea leads to a reduction of oxygen in the blood and an increase in CO2. Then during REM sleep, which is usually when um, hypopnea events occur, only the diaphragm and the parasternal intercostal muscles are active. The parasternals are kind of midway in your rib cage, and they're part of what helps to expand the chest with each breath. But they're getting no other assistance to expand the chest cavity from all the other muscles um, when we're in REM sleep, and the diaphragm's not getting any assistance from anything else. So that when these muscles become weakened, and they're the only ones working while we're in REM sleep, they have a reduction in the ability to solely handle breathing on their own. And as a result, we get into an, a hypopnea event, rapid, shallow breathing. And then dyspnea on exertion. Remember the question in the, in the very beginning, is it exercise-induced asthma? Or is it a reduction in the ability to increase tidal volume in response to increased respiratory demand. So shortness of breath that occurs during physical exertion or exercise is called dyspnea or shortness of breath on exertion. CMT breathing problems on its own causes a reduction in the ability to increase tidal volume as needed. So we're walking across a room we have a reduction, if we have breathing problems from our CMT, we have a reduction in the ability to breathe more deeply, to provide more air to our system, to compensate for the need for more oxygen during physical exertion. When we're riding a stationary bike, when we're on a treadmill, when we're walking up and down stairs without trying to kill ourselves, we have a reduction in the ability to increase tidal volume. 
So what is tidal volume? Tidal volume is the amount of air we need with each breath to keep our body oxygenated. When we're doing something physically demanding, we need more oxygen. Our weakened breathing muscles means we have reduction in the ability to increase that tidal volume. Sometimes doctors think this is asthma, which we're going to get into. Um, usually in CMT anyway, they're usually wrong, not always, because CMTers can still have asthma in addition to CMT-related breathing issues. CMTers can have asthma even when breathing muscles are not weakened, so it's very important for healthcare provider to not only understand the neuromuscular components or the potential neuromuscular components, but needs to understand where asthma leaves off and CMT begins because it might not be asthma. And throwing a bunch of asthma drugs at a CMT or who doesn't have asthma, but instead has CMT-related um, breathing muscle weakness isn't going to solve the issue and is only going to make it worse. So O2 and CO2 levels, this comes up a lot in the community and conversation. For most, while awake, oxygen levels will remain normal. During hypopnea events or nocturnal hypopnea events, O2 will drop. Typically, when we wake up, that O2 level will come back to normal, or at least it should. And when it does, that tells us lung tissue is fine. And this is one of uh, the, the kind of tools we use for knowing if the breathing issues are only CMT or if there's additional things going on. When O2 is considered, especially for a neuromuscular patient, but CMT patient for um, specifically, it has to be given carefully. Too often when we tell our doctors we can't breathe, they automatically just want to put us on oxygen. And that can be a really bad thing. It can make everything worse. O2 should be given only when absolutely needed. What do I mean by absolutely needed? When blood oxygen levels you know, tested with a little pulse oximeter, a little finger thing tells us how much oxygen is in our blood. When we're that's low, Typical rule of thumb, at least here in the States, is below 92. Um, they want to give us oxygen. It's low. Okay, we need oxygen. However, oxygen therapy will increase carbon dioxide levels. The more oxygen we're breathing in, the more carbon dioxide we're creating. We already have a reduction in the ability to clear out carbon dioxide. So it's very important that we advocate that when we're given oxygen, we're also given proper ventilation. That is not bending a room or how much airflow we have in a room, but when we're given oxygen, we have to be given proper ventilation that ensures we get enough air in with each breath so that we can expel enough carbon dioxide to keep that carbon dioxide level at a safe level. So, and that ties into when we treat CMT-related breathing problems, we target CO2 because we need to. We want to manage CO2 levels. They must be kept low. So, how is all this stuff diagnosed? Usually, the go-to is going to be a pulmonary function test or the PFT, the feigned PFT which measures how well the respiratory system is functioning. They're pretty straightforward. So it can show an obstructive lung disease pattern. It can show a restrictive lung disease pattern, or it can show both. CMT-related breathing problems mimic a restricted lung disease pattern on PFT. And this is where that misconception comes from, if you remember. So respiratory muscle weakness reveals itself when tested while lying flat, then compared to when upright. Most pulmonary function testing labs don't have the means by which to lay us flat, 
to then do what's called spirometry to compare it when upright. However, we can advocate for just simply stringing together a couple chairs so we can lie flat so that they can stretch over their couple little test devices to test us while laying flat. For a non-neuromuscular specialty pulmonary clinic, being able to do this will really open their eyes. Pulmonary function lab or a, um, a neuromuscular pulmonary function lab, um, any clinic that has neuromuscular pulmonology expertise, when we're in front of them, they'll know that CMT is a neuromuscular disease and we'll tell them we can't breathe. We especially can't breathe when we're lying flat on our back. They'll already know and they won't have to lay us flat to uh, be able to tell the difference. They'll just, they, they, they're already that well-versed. And I, what did I pass up again? Scoliosis-induced restrictive lung disease. Remember the caveat that I mentioned? CMT causes scoliosis. You know, it's quite common. So while CMT-related breathing issues are not a restrictive lung disease, because CMT does not cause restrictive lung disease, while scoliosis is common in CMT, it can become severe enough to impact chest cavity volume. When this happens, we have what's referred to as scoliosis-induced restrictive lung disease. Scoliosis can change the shape of our chest cavity. Changing that shape can restrict our lungs from functioning normally. So even if we could expand our chest cavity more, the change in the shape restricts us from expanding it enough to then expand the lungs enough for getting a full breath. And when scoliosis is severe enough in CMT to cause a restrictive lung disease, we call that CMT-induced scoliosis-related scoliosis restrictive lung disease. And when this happens, it's a tertiary consequence of CMT. So CMT is not directly causing this particular restrictive lung disease. Rather, it's being caused because CMT is causing something else that's then causing the restrictive lung disease. So as confusing as that can be, we can basically sum it up into CMT doesn't cause a restrictive lung disease. However, if you have scoliosis that is severe enough to cause a change in chest cavity shape and volume, which is a scoliosis severe enough to require surgery, then as a kind of tertiary third step cause, CMT is being linked to a restrictive lung disease, but CMT itself is not causing the restrictive lung disease. Kenny, can I just interrupt for one second? Uh -huh. uh, I just want to say that that is exactly a clear case of what happened to me. Yeah, I, I, uh, with, with 4C, I, I could see where your scoliosis could become severe enough, probably in an early age, to warrant surgery because had, it, because it impacts. I myself, yeah. yeah. Yep. So if anybody wants to see classic x-rays of exactly how that affected my lungs are all on my social media accounts so yep um how, how have you fared after the corrective surgery with your breathing um well i had uh i do have the vocal cord issue if i talk too much it does get weak and crackly uh i did over the period of a few years sometimes the lungs did get weaker sometimes they got stronger so I would go through these periods over the years of they'd get better and they'd get worse I do notice depending on oxidative stress and where I am if I'm in a very polluted environment obviously my breathing is nasty if I'm somewhere where it's a little bit cleaner like closer to an ocean or a body of water whole other story how about that and then yeah. 
you know, how hard do the muscles have to work to get through all that garbage air? Oh, it's canny. It's, it's nasty. I can tell you being more inland where I am, especially in oil and gas country, is a massive difference compared to if I go out to the coast or when we were in Boston, you can take a deep breath in and you feel completely different. Mm-hmm. So that your en- environment that you're living in makes a big difference on your lungs. Yeah, crazy how that works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's that's all I wanted to pipe in on. So thanks, Kenny. All right, thank you. So bedside spirometry to quantify breathing muscle weakness. This this is kind of an easy one. And however, not every pulmonologist has the, the capability to do this. So spirometry can be done bedside in the office, which is just when you're in the exam room. And it typically measures just a certain set of parameters, which is forced expiratory volume in one second, which is how hard can you breathe out and that volume of air that you breathe out in one second. Forced vital capacity, how, how much air you breathe in quickly. The maximum inspiratory pressure, which is um, the how hard you're drawing air in with each breath. The maximum expiratory pressure which is how hard you're pushing air out. And then the maximum voluntary minute ventilation, which is the overall volume of air you can move in one minute. And these combine um, to provide a really good picture of any type of an obstructive process in your lungs or restrictive process in the lungs. Remember how CMT breathing issues mimic a restrictive lung disease pattern. And then they also combine to paint a really good picture of any present breathing muscle weakness. And the beauty of being able to do it bedside is they don't need a fancy pulmonary function lab to do this. You can do it while sitting up, and then you can do it while laying down on the exam table. And that's when our respiratory muscle weakness really starts to show through. And I always um, mention these things whenever I can, because if, and most of us, when we're with a healthcare provider who doesn't have the level of expertise that we need for our breathing, these become very important self-advocacy tools. And hopefully the provider is teachable and will um, listen to us and try what we suggest because it really does make a huge difference in our care when they're able to see that we have a significant reduction by significant reduction, general rule of thumb, at least here in the States, is if we have a 10% or greater change, worse change when lying down compared to when upright, it indicates breathing muscle weakness. And a healthcare provider being able to see this will, or at least hopefully will, change the treatment course, which will change our outcome. And then how do we treat this stuff once we convince them and let them know that, hey, CMT has caused our breathing issues? So although there isn't an available treatment for CMT, the many things that CMT causes can be treated and well-managed. This is very important. Probably the most important thing for us to help our healthcare providers with because too often we get can't treat it so why bother while there isn't a disease modifying treatment that is a treatment which specifically targets the underlying cause of the disease everything cmt causes can be treated can be managed some things better than others but we can manage them everything is individualized everything is treating the symptoms as they present And this includes breathing problems that are caused by CMT. Typically, for us, treatment starts with some general breathing exercises that focus on expanding the chest cavity as much as we can with each breath, and then treating any present obstructive sleep apnea. Most of our treatment starts with a sleep study, where apnea is identified, then they throw us on CPAP. CPAP, as we mentioned just a few minutes ago, often fails in CMT. And not just specific to CMT, but most other neuromuscular-induced breathing problems. 
And it lies in how the therapy itself functions and how it's designed. Pressure therapy, it's the go-to. CPAP, BiPAP, and VPAP, what are these acronyms? CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It provides a continuous, non-changing air pressure. We breathe in one out, we breathe in one pressure, and we have that same pressure when we're trying to breathe out. It's design limited to keeping the airway open only. That's all it's designed to do. It can't treat central sleep apnea. It cannot treat breathing muscle weakness. But it's very effective for obstructive sleep apnea as long as there's no additional respiratory muscle weakness. The next step up would be BiPAP, or what's called bi-level positive airway pressure. And really, BiPAP, is a trademark name for a device that we just kind of adopted. So we call it BiPAP. Its true name is bi-level positive airway pressure. It provides a higher pressure when we're breathing in, drops down the pressure when we're breathing out, so we're not trying to exhale against such a high pressure. Of course, these pressures themselves are very minute, maxed out. They're about a quarter of one pound per square inch. Very, very minimal, but they can create significant issues for us. Because we have one pressure for breathing in, we drop it down lower for breathing out, it can be far more comfortable than just a single pressure CPAP, but it's design limited for keeping only the airway open. VPAP is the next step up, which is variable positive airway pressure. VPAP is more comfortable than, bi than um, BiPAP for many. Um, VPAP kind of varies the pressure throughout the use cycle as the machine detects is needed. However, it too is still designed only to keep the airway open. How do you know if you're, if it fails? I mean, I'm on a CPAP, like, and how do you know if it, you said if it fails? Or if um, so on CPAP, how difficult is it for you to breathe out against the pressure of the mask? Uh, not so bad, I not guess. Not so bad. That's a plus. Um, do you feel better using CPAP than without? Some. What? Some better. Yeah. Then it's at least starting to work. So, so that's a plus. The next question would be the data um, with uh, these different therapies. What becomes um, important is uh, the AHI index or the apnea hypopnea index. And that's a set of data um, that the machine records that um, kind of tells us how well the therapy is working. Mm -hmm. Typically, we want an AHI that is below 10. We'll mm -hmm. love below 10. Ideally, five or below is considered perfect. So looking at your machine data, that current setup, if it's at or below 10, um, it's considered a success, uh, um, successful treatment. If it's right. above 10 and we make some adjustments and no matter what we do, we can't get your AHI below 10, um, it's considered a failed therapy. Okay. Well, Can I you. ask something? Even, <clears throat> even if it's helping you the uh, amount of time you stop breathing, for instance, if you were tested for it and you stop breathing 34 times. <clears throat> now when you're using the machine, you only stop breathing once or twice. Right. I mean that would be a you know a huge improvement, a definite success. That that's what that's what I'm I'm doing. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But then that would yep. be good. Okay. Yep. That, that, that would be great. I would consider that a win. Yeah. Um, especially okay. if it's comfortable for you to use. And if you're generally feeling better with it than without, I would definitely put that in the win column. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. So for many of us, um, when we have breathing muscle weakness, the pressure only uh, therapy fails. And that's because we have um, not only a, a difficult time exhaling against the pressure of the mask, um, but also because pressure only cannot assist weakened breathing muscles. So to assist weakened breathing muscles, we need something called volume therapy. And there's two types, AVAPs and IVAPs. So AVAP stands for Average Volume Assured Pressure Support. It adds volume support in addition to the pressure support. Volume support 
provides a metered volume of air or measured volume of air consistently with each breath. This volume of air is equal to tidal volume, which of course is the amount of air we need to keep our bodies oxygenated with every breath. The volume uh, support enables the lungs to more fully inflate with each breath with less muscle effort. And the less being able to breathe with uh, less muscle effort gives our weakened muscles a much needed break. And this volume support also treats central sleep apnea, which pressure support cannot do. And then the other type of volume support is called IVAPs, which is intelligent volume assured pressure support. IVAPs is a little different than AVAPs in that IVAPs attempts to calculate the negative space in the lungs and then adjust the volume as needed. And this kind of approach targets what we call alveolar volume or the volume of all the little millions of air sacs that are in the lungs. This kind of provides a, a little bit of an advantage because the volume can automatically adjust as needed with each breath, where AVAPs is just uh, um, a single volume that doesn't change, although the pressure will change like a VPAP. It enables IVAPs, you know, it enables the lungs to more fully inflate with each breath with less muscle effort, just like AVAPs. And just like AVAPs, the volume support gives our muscles a much needed break. So why is volume support needed when we have breathing muscle weakness? So CMT-induced respiratory muscle weakness causes a reduction in the ability to fully expand the chest cavity with each breath, thereby causing a reduction in the ability to fully inflate the lungs with each breath. Volume support assists these weakened breathing muscles to inflate the lungs with an adequate volume of air with each breath. And this assistance gives the weakened, overworked breathing muscles a much needed break. So our weakened breathing muscles often become uh, further weakened by fatigable weakness. The volume support from these machines kind of quells that down and gives everything a break so it can kind of chill out for a minute and recover. The pressure-only therapy cannot provide this assistance. I'm going to back up before, before moving on. So back in the day, um, only until um, maybe four or five years ago, healthcare providers used to use BiPAP to create a volume control or a volume advantage. And they use something that's kind of loosely referred to as a pressure break differential. And what this means is they would run inhale pressure on a BiPAP up as high as what we would tolerate. And that's generally about a 25 or 25. Um, what's the unit of measure on 25 millimeters of water? And then they would drop for exhaling the pressure down to an absolute bare minimum. And the, the kind of the, the math behind this, the science, the, the, the belief behind it was the greater the difference in pressure between inhaling and exhaling would create a bigger assistance for the weakened muscles. When engineers started developing this volume therapy, we realized that this pressure break differential approach really wasn't what we thought it was. It wasn't providing any kind of an assistance to the muscles. They weren't getting a break and they were working just as hard as without this uh, therapy approach. So where some today still try to use this method, there's newer technology available that actually accomplishes what the engineers were trying to do with BiPAP, but couldn't. And then the complications, if all of this stuff goes untreated, can be fairly severe. Untreated obstructive sleep apnea can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension causes additional shortage of breath, which we don't need, and it can impact cardiac function when it's left untreated. It can wreak habit on the full right side of your heart. CMT-related muscle weakness or breathing muscle weakness leads to atelectasis. Atelectasis is the medical term 
for the little tiny air sacs in the lungs collapsing. On a chest x-ray, this will sometimes be termed as lung scarring, which on x-ray, lung scarring and atelectasis refer to the same thing. In CMT, we typically, in CMT, when there's breathing involvement, we typically see what's called bibacillar atelectasis, which is atelectasis, which is set into the lower lobes of both lungs. And this sets in because we have a reduction in the ability to inflate the lungs with each breath. So over time, these air sacs don't get inflated as we breathe in, so they collapse on themselves and they become plugged up with mucus and don't function. A weak cough usually accompanies CMT-related breathing problems because the same muscles, again, used for breathing are used for coughing. This weak cough means we can't clear out our lungs. And this contributes to the atelectasis because the air sacs become plugged up and then they collapse on themselves. Elevated CO2 in CMT-related um, breathing issues can get high enough uh, to create a condition called hypercapnia. Hypercapnia, when left untreated, causes worse, uh, worse health problems than can low oxygen. So low oxygen will completely wreck us. Hypercapnia can wreck us even more. And this is why treating CMT, breathing muscle weakness, focuses on managing CO2 levels to a healthy level. Who do you see? for all this stuff. It's best to see a neuromuscular pulmonologist. Neuromuscular pulmonology isn't necessarily um, its own unique subspecialty of medicine, but a neuromuscular pulmonologist is a pulmonologist who specializes in respiratory impairment caused by neuromuscular diseases. These guys are really hard to find, as we all know, but a really good place to start is any MDA clinic. And I know the MDA operates in Australia. Um, MDA clinics always have pulmonology specialty. They have pulmonology specialty because many of the muscular dystrophies affect breathing muscles. And like ALS, myasthenia gravis, CMT is not a form of muscular dystrophy despite a lot of confusion. However, the MDA provides patient care services to CMT just like they do ALS and, AM, and uh, MG. With this care, often, well, I shouldn't say often, but in every MDA clinic is pulmonology expertise. And these are the guys we need to see. If you don't have an MDA clinic close to you, pick up the phone, start calling pulmonology offices. Ask them how many uh, pulmonology or how many neuromuscular patients they see every week. If that number is less than 25, they might not be the right person for you. But if they're the only person, they're the only person. Get in and see them, advocate. Hopefully, they're teachable and will listen to you and kind of get you on the right path to getting your breathing managed. So if you have breathing involvement with CMT, you don't have to suffer. You don't have to accept that CMT doesn't cause breathing problems when your doctor tells you that. The problems are real. There are real treatment options available with these real problems. The landscape of this topic is changing, but it still needs a lot of self-advocacy on our part as patients. So don't hesitate to push back when needed, because getting your breathing managed means a significant improvement to your quality of life. And I can't stress that enough. So if you have any questions, and my mic just died again, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, then maybe my headset died. So if you have any questions um, after today, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email's on the screen. Find me in social media. Hit me up in a discussion thread. Tag me in a group. Uh, hit Light me up in Facebook Messenger. If I don't have an answer to your question, I will do everything I can to point you in the right direction. If you haven't yet, when we're done, please join GRIN and get your breathing symptoms recorded. The data are desperately needed to change the landscape in healthcare.
so that we're no longer marginalized when it comes to seeking care for our breathing issues. And with that, let's open it up to some questions. I'd love to hear what's on everybody's minds. I've got one, Kenny. I'm going to start it off, if you yeah, don't abso mind. Absolutely. Let's see okay. if I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen so I can say, hey, there's everybody. I figured it out. <laughs> okay. I'm going to throw a curveball at you and see if you can answer this for me. So I have 4C. I am the only one diagnosed in my family so far. My parents are both carriers. My mother is, what, in her late 70s. And she's been having pulmonary issues for quite a while that nobody has been able to diagnose for her. Um, and I'm wondering now, do you know if how, many, how much pulmonary issues can affect those who are just carriers of CMT? Um, that, that's a good question. And one that we, we in the CMT science community don't have an answer to. Because we know that you know, 4C is uh, recessive. Mm -hmm. So we know we need two mutations in the SH3TC2 gene. Mm -hmm. We know typically that means we're the only one in the family to have CMT. Mm -hmm. We know typically we would expect you know, mom to have one copy of that mutation, dad to have another. But what we don't know are to the extent at which unaffected family carriers are affected. That's what my concern was too, is that yeah. how symptoms present in those who aren't completely full blown, but still carry. Yeah, is there any know. research being done on that? To my knowledge, there hasn't been any research done on it yet. I know mm -hmm. at least on part of the, the SWORD trial, um, mm -hmm. SWORD CMT is recessive. And data is showing that unaffected family member carriers also have high sorbitol levels like the sword CMTers do, but not to the same extent that sword CMTers do. They're, they're elevated mildly, which is causing a very mild neuropathy that's more um, similar to a diabetic neuropathy than CMT. Mm -hmm. So, so would not, it be worth something still, even though she's not full-blown type 4 going into a pulmonary specialist? Because she's been chasing for years and being pr prescribed all kinds of things and nothing's helping. And now after watching your presentation, I'm thinking, huh. I mean, I, I can't say. In, right, right. right. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's possible until it's not possible, right? Yeah. The, the so one to, to reach out to, really, um, would be Cleopas. Oh, yes. Okay. Because he, he is quite the 4C guru and he's doing some work in 4C right now. Okay, you are right. And I'm on the task force now, so now I'm going to... Okay, so I, I, I think he would be perfect to have that conversation with. Okay, I'll do that, Kenny. And, and okay. he would definitely Thanks. know I before I would. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Kenny. Oh, you're welcome. Um, hey, Kenny, can I just ask you, um, when I'm halfway through a sentence, I have to stop and have a, and take a big deep breath. And, and that's what we're talking about today. Is that the, the CMT and the breathing? And because my my mum, who I've told you is very bad with CMT, she can she's no longer got speech. She's lost all of her speech, and you can't understand her. Um, and she doesn't like going out anywhere because she's embarrassed because nobody can understand her. Um, and that is all to do with the breathing. Yeah, well, well, with it, it definitely can be for me. It is. I, mean, I don't know yeah. how much um, everybody um, here today can tell, but I'm starting to struggle with my voice too since we yeah, started. Yeah, it, it's, get, it's getting weak, and I'm having a hard yeah. time forming words. You've um, done very well lasting that well, long. Oh, thank, thank you. And um, I'm running out of air mid-word as yeah. well. That's, and that's part of my breathing issues. Doing, yeah, that's what I find. I, it doesn't matter whether I'm just sitting down doing nothing, which is what I always do, and I am pooped. Like you know, really it's struggling yeah. Be before um we really um started to understand my breathing issues before we even realized I had breathing issues caused by my CMT. I used to joke around that I could tell by how much I had overdone it and worn myself out 
by how sore my voice got. And I didn't even uh-huh. have to be talking. Just any kind of physical activity would just mm-hmm. completely destroy my voice. Mm-hmm. And I come to learn now that um, my breathing muscles are weakened by my CMT. And as a result, through something called compensatory activation, my vocal cords are trying to make up for some of that breathing muscle weakness by doing breathing. And uh, I have a brilliant ear, nose, and throat doctor um, who's looked at it with a camera and visualized it that the vocal cords are trying to breathe when I can't. Yeah, that makes and, sense. And, yeah, and, and now, you know, although 1A, we don't typically, and I'm going to be very careful here, we typically don't see vocal cord weakness in 1A. And I'm saying that carefully because we don't study it in 1A. Um, I do have vocal cord weakness now setting in. It was visualized. I'm starting two years ago. Because they used to and say, well, well no breathing either. I'm and sorry? you have 1A, Kenny? I have 1A, yep. Genetically oh. confirmed. Really? I have type 2, 2 AM, and you hear my voice. Yep, I do. When, when I speak, I run out of air. I can it's tell. The- darndest thing i've been talking like on zoom with family and stuff and i'm really excited about something i'm trying to talk real fast and get it out i almost black out kenny oh wow i'm scared i we just moved back to california three years ago and i lost my husband a year ago that's made it tough too but I do take care of myself. The health insurance company I go to, pulmonology, did a sleep test. He called me, the pulmonologist, and he says, do you need to be ventilated? I said, excuse me, is it that bad? He goes, you're not doing so well. And I says, I've always been been a shallow breather and I was 58 when I first started noticing Charcot Marie Tooth and I just got diagnosed in October of 21 I looked at the doctor and said listen there is something really wrong with me and that's when they sent me for complete genome testing and it came back I have a BiPAP machine. I do not feel that it's something that is really helping that much. I was most interested in the other types of ventilation that you also showed. Yeah, BiPAP is um, wrong for you. Would a center of excellence, like I'm near Stanford or UC San Francisco, do you think I should try to jump in there? Let them take a look at all yes. of this. Get specifically, get in to see Dr. John Day. Yes, I've okay. seen the name. Yep. Excellent. Um, yeah, it's uh, when, when you do call, specifically request um, Dr. Day. Good. So they don't try to um, schedule you with somebody else. I was hoping you would have been closer to L.A. Uh, um, L.A. down at Cedars has my buddy Ashraf El Saeed. Um, in state, he can do um, telehealth with you. Cool. So Ashraf I, would be the one to see and talk to. I'm near Sacramento, and I mean, I can go either direction, Bay mm-hmm. Area or L.A. Yeah, if, it, if, if you are able to get to L.A., Dr. El Saeed is who you okay. need to see. Excellent. Very good. Yeah, I fact, told I will enough. real quick. I will type his name into chat. Okay. In his names on the slide, um, Wayne will be providing the presentation to everybody after we're done in a PDF form. Okay. So you can have all the info. Okay. And it may it may not be exactly after we're done, but you'll get it within the next twenty four hours. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I'm not in any rush for anything. That's that's great. 
Yes, I said to my husband when I was diagnosed with this, I said, oh, honey, what's next? I said, I feel like I'm going to go to bed and just not wake up, just not breathe. Yeah. It, it's, it's, the, the fear is real. The fear is real. And you shouldn't have to live like that. Help is out there. COVID took me three weeks. I tested yeah. positive from the shallow lung breathing. It just wasn't going anywhere. So, yep. and, and anyway. when we... When we have weakened breathing muscles, it can be that much worse because we don't have um, the same ability to clear the lungs. Yes. Very good. Worse. That's my story. I learned so much today. It's incredible. Well, thank you. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for attending. Kenny, Kenny. can I ask you a question, Kenny? Of course. I live in um, the cold weather state of uh, Pennsylvania. I'm in Detroit. And, yeah, I'm right outside of Pittsburgh. And I noticed the last two, especially last winter, the cold, the very cold weather just really seems to take the breath out of me. Now, is that is that common with the CMT? I mean, it's, it's not necessarily common with CMT. Um. But it happens with me as well. I don't know if it's uh, person specific. I don't know if it's uh, related to breathing muscle weakness. But I can say it definitely happens to me. Yeah, I noticed the winter. The winters are bad, but even in the summertime, I I don't even have to have my air conditioning on a lot because um, I'm cool enough. I'm comfortable. I'm mostly always cold anyway. But um, I just noticed it the last year or two and the older I get. So I want to just uh, get your opinion. Thank you. No, you're welcome. I mean, it, it's, it, it's reasonable um, to, to, to kind of consider, describe it, that because the cold air um, can be more difficult for the lungs to deal with, when we mm -hmm. have weakened breathing muscles, it can become that much more difficult to move air. Okay. Um, but I, but I, I can't necessarily say it's directly because of CMT or not. Okay. Kennedy, I have a question from down under, if possible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Diane's taking a bit of a rest, but she uh, uses a Phillips Trilogy machine and running relatively high pressures of 8 and 28, and she's suffering more and more from gas buildup in her abdomen overnight uh, to an extent where I can see some nodding going on here, uh, to an extent where it actually wakes her prematurely in the mornings uh, when she has to, um, how can I say this delicately, let it out. Uh, is this, uh, can anything be done about that or is it just uh, suck it up? I would venture a guess that some of the settings and the trilogy are wrong and need to be adjusted. Yeah. Um, I, I right. would. Yeah. So it, yes. it's, it's not necessarily uncommon for some of that air to bypass and uh, we end up swallowing it, but it should be minimal. It, it shouldn't be um, a disruptive amount of air. With that happening, oh, okay. um, um, I would suspect that some of those esophageal muscles have become weakened. The muscles at the top of the throat have become weakened. And that because so much air is bypassing, the machine setup is incorrect. With the high pressure being set at 28, um, that's probably too high. The most typically we handle about 25 tops. Anything beyond that begins, uh, becomes uncomfortable. So the maximum inspiratory pressure might be a little high. And then also um, a setting called the ramp might be a little high so that it might be ramping up on pressure too fast. So that might be something that could be tweaked. There might be a couple okay. other settings in there that might be tweaked. Uh, my biggest uh, piece of advice uh, would be to communicate these things with um, whomever the provider is and overshare, over-communicate. When, uh, okay. 
when I ended up on AVAPS um, four or five years ago now, I think, definitely pre-pandemic, um, it's weird how we kind of use the, the COVID as our line of debarkation. Everything was pre-pandemic or it's now. It's, it's crazy. Uh -huh. um, my, my AVAPS goes pre-pandemic and I over-communicated getting it tweaked in um, to where we needed it to be. And what I mean by over-communicating, um, my pulmonology team started out with just a baseline setup based off of kind of their own expertise and then my sleep study data. Um, and then see you, Joy. Um, and then, um, where was I? Oh, um, machine setup. So based on their expertise in my sleep study data, they kind of set it up with the initial setup. And then I was communicating with them every day, sending them an email or a message through a portal. Um, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm not feeling. And they were adjusting, not as quick as what I like. Um, they're like, no, let's not adjust it every day. Let's give it a little bit of time to, to see how you um, adapt to it. But my point is share everything, share it as constantly as uh, you can be a thorn in their side because I believe that they can't get the machine set up the way she needs it unless they have a full picture and they know exactly what the setup is doing or not doing for her. Okay. Thank you so much. The, uh, the other um, side effect of, uh, of it all is uh, and I've lost it here. I was going to make some some point to do with the machine. It uh, doesn't matter. I'll, I'll come back later when I think of it. Sorry, it's just sort of a, a brain. Not uh, at all. Not yeah. at all. Okay, I'll come back when I think of it. Thank you very much for the no. effort anyway. I appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. So, Kenny, I just want to... Um... So look, they've just tested me again with the oximeter at night, right? Um, on my AVAP, and my oxygen was. It, they said you're supposed to have an average of a thousand mils, and I was getting four hundred and thirty. And then I changed my the mask, and I'm up to four hundred and eighty five mils. Is like, is that like? showing that it's working or is there anything else you can do to increase the oxygen or do you know any you know now if if the if your tidal volume went from uh, what would you say it went for 30 what were those numbers and i improved it with a better mask to 485 and okay she, so 430 and to 485 it be a thousand okay so 430 I'm to 485 less. is a significant improvement in mask seals so you're right. losing okay. less air and that's yep. good because we want that volume of air getting into our lungs so yep. at every machine every mask every hose has kind of a built-in uh, margin of error for air loss right generally about five to seven percent air loss um is kind of optimal we don't want anything beyond seven percent so yep. when you're when your um, numbers numbers you gave are um the tidal volume, which is how much air we're actually breathing uh, in. So a yeah. uh, uh, change from 430 to 485 is significant. You definitely had a wrong mask before changing masks. So there's a definite yeah. benefit there. Um, do you have an um, Do you have an Apple Watch or or an Android uh, any other smartwatch or device? No, no. Um, my I, daughter I, wants. She's behind me. She wants me. To get one, I love, I, yeah, I, it, so. I, I love my Apple Watch because I don't know how to use it. I, I've had it for nope. you know, several months now, <laughs> um, but it uh, provides a really nice trend line of sleeping data because ah. it monitors uh, breaths per minute, it monitors heart rate, it monitors the sleep cycle, and it monitors O2 levels. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so it's interesting. Yeah. So, let me tell so, you what. Else, let me tell you what else it does. If you fall, it will call for help for you. Yes, it will. <laughs> Isn't that yep, cool? it definitely will. They're, they're wonderful <laughs> devices. I know the Android watches do the same. 
Um, some of the Fitbits, um, Garmin's and whatnot um, also do the same. You need one, Maz. Yeah, <laughs> Trace has been trying to talk me into it, Dev, yeah. for a year. Talk me into it, Trace. I keep like, like putting it off. Right. <laughs> no, I, put it on. I hate wearing watches and rings and things around my neck and anything Doesn't like matter. that. Struggle. <laughs> There'll be one under the Christmas tree for you. <laughs> <laughs> so when you get up in the morning, Maz, do you have any headaches or anything like that? So like you, like you probably that. did before you know, therapy? My problem was I was falling asleep all the time everywhere. Like, I mean, I would get up and and, and two hours later I could fall asleep just with mm. it, no reason, none. Mm. I could even fall asleep walking when they first diagnosed me. It was absolutely scary. Fell asleep standing up, fell over, and cracked I, my head. I have about the same amount of time as you have, Kenny. Um, yeah, so they've increased my volume up to 19, but if it goes... Uh, They've been doing it at a quarter of a, 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 a turn um, because I actually stop breathing more when it's too high, when it goes higher. So they're, tr they're that's then they're just trying to, um, they want to get me up to a tidal volume of 500, but I, I don't know. If yeah. The, do um, the, so a, a couple pulmonology visits ago, we um, looked at the data for my machine. And so for females, the rule of thumb tidal volume is 450 for adult females. For adult males, the rule of thumb is 500 right. for tidal volume. Um, mine is set at like 530, I believe. Is it five? No, yeah. it's 500. And the data shows that I was actually uh, pulling 548. So, right. you know, everybody thought, all right, well, if you're pulling this much, but it's only set down here, we're going to bump it up. So we can't bump it to 548. We can only go in increments of five. So we bumped right. it up to 545 and was absolutely terrible. Yeah, It was like I was back on the old single pressure CPAP. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, yeah, I, I tried to give it a week just to be nice. Um not wanting to upset them with my oversharing like I did a few years ago. Um, and I sent a portal message in and I got a response back that they're all on vacation, that it's been forwarded to the physician who's uh, filling in. And then I still didn't get, had anything a day later. So I you know, YouTubed how to access the settings menus and changed it back myself. And it, so it, it's, I, I always, you know, from my own experience, kind of caution increasing tidal volume too much because it can end up yep. uh, um, causing more problems than it solves. Yeah, it makes you go backwards. So Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks for that, Kenny. Oh, you're welcome. Ken Kenny, I'll remember. See you, everybody. <laughs> and get <laughs> off now. <laughs> Hi, Kenny. I remembered what it was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the reason Diane's pressure has been increased progressively over the several years she's been on cpap vpap trilogy now for 24 years uh is because her co2 um levels in her blood were continually uh rising every three months or six months they were going up and i think the last reading was about 68 percent uh and i got a feeling that the um the uh, doctor's and now I sort of a bit of a brick wall and not quite sure what to do. So uh, I will pursue the uh, ABAP side of things. Yeah, the, the Trilogy is a fantastic, wonderful machine. Um, it's an, it's has IVAPS capability. So yeah. if they have it turned okay. on, if they have it turned on, um, which they might not, just from what you just described no, with, with, with CO2 climbing, um, they should turn it on. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not on IVAPs. Yeah, if turning the volume on um, might help with the air swallowing as well. Okay, all right. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, you're and, welcome. Uh, I'm going to bail out now, and I'll look at the results later on. Thanks for putting it on, Wayne. And hi to everybody, and bye to everybody. Bye, right. Jim. Thanks, thanks for bye joining bye. us. Bye. bye. You're welcome. Ken, did you say that this is going to be able to 
we can watch it back on YouTube later on. Yes. Yeah. Well, once once we're done. Um, oh, and get the recording all bundled up and everything. I'll get it uploaded to YouTube so everybody can rewatch it. So I'm recording this question and answer session too. And you've got a YouTube channel yourself? I do. Yep, I do. Oh, what's the name of yours so I can add you to um, it? You, you can um, CMT Kenny B. Yep. All one Kenny word. Kenny B. Okay, CMT Kenny B. Yep. Thanks, Kenny. Oh, you're welcome. You'll be added. Boy, we all of a sudden got really quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we're out of breath. <laughs> right? <laughs> we can no longer talk and we're all out of breath. I know it well. <laughs> Just taking it all in. <laughs> well, I'm going to bail as well, and I'm going to go and have some lunch. So, uh, Darvin, I have... Good evening, so good afternoon to all in front of you. Thank you, uh, Wayne and Kenny, for organizing it. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. yeah, pleasure. I'll catch you all soon. All right, take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye, right. Bye, Bye. I'm going to do the same, and thank you so much. It's been really informative, it has been. Oh, uh, you're welcome. You're wonderful people. Thank you. It's really good to see all these people that I see the names of. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always great to put voices to names too it is awesome. at least for me it is it is uh, uh, thank you so much for everything today it's been wonderful listening uh, thank you so much you're welcome thank you bye everybody all the best of luck god bless bye 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 yeah. bye well, I'm going to sign off now too so thanks awesome. for putting everything together and taking time out of your Sunday to do this and i may uh send you a message yeah message please do again. please do don't hesitate all right thanks again everyone have a good night all right thank you all right bye-bye yeah it was wonderful meeting everybody thank you Wayne, for inviting me it was great to connect with like across all these continents it kenny i'm really going to be cool. in touch with you because i want you to come and speak at one of my virtual meetings absolutely I think that's Canada, I'm, more, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Yeah, just Canada before anyone, awesome. just before anyone further disappears, as Kenny said, um, I'll be emailing out a copy of the presentation within the next twenty four hours. That'll be to the email address that you registered, <laughs> along with um, a, a book that's available from um, CNT and Breathing on Kenny's website. That oh, okay. is also a PD, PDF format that I'll send out as well. Uh, so Kenny's information's on there as far as uh, Facebook or anything like that? Um, well, the, there's two documents. There'll be the presentation that he done today, plus he's got is – it, is it a book, Kenny? Um, so the um, we're going to provide um, a PDF version of the CMT and breathing page from my website experts in cmt.com yep. and the pdf version includes all the academic sources with the full bibliography for them yeah oh, thank you so no, experts in cmt.com is the uh yep yeah, experts in cmt.com okay thank you check it out it's worth all wonderful thank you all it was wonderful meeting all you right all. thanks good seeing Bye. you again thanks for joining in same here. Bye. Thank you very much. Stay warm up there. Bye, oh, everyone. I'm over it, man. I'm over it. <laughs> See you later, guys. I'm going to bow out, too. Thank you. All right. Thank Kenny. you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And Thanks thank for joining you, in. Of course. Finally, some answers. Good God almighty. <laughs> You're not Take alone. Care. You're not alone. Oh, I see this. My goodness. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.